Good morning, Christ Fellowship. This is Bart coming to you from my office with Tuesday's Holy Week devotion. Uh, this morning we're going to be looking at what we call the Olivet Discourse, uh, which is Jesus' longest, most extensive treatment on last things that we have in the Bible. And so, in the Bible, so um, you can look at Matthew chapter 24 and 25. That's where I'll be. There are parallel accounts uh, in Mark chapter 13 as well as Luke chapter 21. Um, but I'll focus on really just Matthew chapter 24, 24 and 25. There's actually 97 verses. Um, chapter 25 is kind of illustrating a lot of the things that Jesus taught in chapter 24. Um, and so um, one of the things that when we come to um, a passage like this, and certainly there are others like it in the Bible, but when we come to a passage like this, um, and that's pretty difficult, and there's a lot of you know, discussion and debate about, um, we can sometimes get lost in the details. And um, I'm not saying the details are unimportant. They are not. In fact, we're going to talk about some of the details here in just a minute. Um, but we can become sort of lost in the details uh, and then really miss the sort of the bigger picture that uh, is being communicated in this passage of Scripture. And so what I want to do is to, to kind of walk you through it, uh, at least parts of this, um, and then make sure that we understand sort of the big picture that is being communicated here. And so uh, I'll kind of back up where really the beginning in chapter 23, uh, because it's really important that we see the connection between what Jesus has been saying, what he has been teaching, what has been going on in, uh, in this last week, uh, in particular, in chapter 23, and then how that is then answered in chapter 24, one of the last days of, uh, of course, or on this Tuesday in particular, of Holy Week. And so uh, if you look back in chapter 23, uh, up in verse 38, um, or really the whole passage first, and I'll look at verse 38. But chapter 23 of Matthew is one of the most stern and sober teachings we ever see Jesus give. Uh, it's, it's the woes against the Pharisees. And so the Pharisees have been, you know, opponents of Jesus, his opponents of Jesus' ministry, his teaching throughout the Gospels. Uh, and at the close, that last week, uh, Jesus finally issues seven woes against the Pharisees. And, and, and by the way, really kind of a bookend to that or sort of a, a good way to think about that uh, in the structure of the Gospel of Matthew is you begin the Beatitudes in Matthew chapter 5, verses 3 and following. There are the blessings that, that rest on the followers of Jesus. Uh, and then kind of the opposite of that are these woes that are communicated in chapter 23. Uh, and so there's blessings for those that are poor in spirit. Um, but there are woes for those who double down on their pride. It's a lesson even in the beginning. But uh, in verse 38, though, that kind of concludes where Jesus says, see, your, he speaks about the judgment that is going to uh, be poured out upon them. He says, see your house, which, you know, we would understand uh, not only their sort of organization or their, their people, but, but in particular the temple. It says, see, your house is left to you desolate, for I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And so Jesus really begins here, what, what begins this teaching on the last days is a condemnation of the Pharisees and the religious leaders of his day. That's critically important that we realize that Jesus is not simply teaching about the last days in the abstract. I mean, this again, this is this is answering something. This is almost the, the, the continuation of a conversation that Jesus is having, a lesson that Jesus is teaching. And notice then how it unfolds, beginning in verse 1 of chapter 24. Jesus left the temple. He was going away. When his disciples came to point out to him the buildings of the temple, he just said the house is going to be left desolate. Everything that sort of surrounds the temple, it seems stable. It seems firm. And he answers them. You see all of these, do you not? Truly, I say to you, there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. That, in turn, prompts a couple of questions about the Pharisees. And so you can imagine, I mean, this is, you know, this is the centerpiece. The temple is the centerpiece. It's stable. They've known this all their life. Um, and Jesus said it's all coming down. And so they ask him in verse 3, privately, after a while, they, they said, tell us, when will these things be? 
and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? I want to point out to you, and I want to mark it in your Bible there, that there are really two questions that are asked. First, tell us when will these things be? That's the first question. And the second, what will be the sign of of your coming and of the end of the age. Now, whether or not the disciples meant that as two questions, what I want to point out to you is that Jesus answers those as two questions. And so the first one is, tell us when will these things be? Those these things, they have a referent. I mean, it's what it's what Jesus has been talking about, that the stone, not one stone will be left on another. The disciples naturally want to know, when is this temple going to be destroyed? When is all of this coming down? And then the second part, what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? The, the, the disciples, more than likely, they, they put those two together. Well, when, when is the temple coming down? And along with that, what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? And what we see is Jesus really pulls those two apart. And he answers the first question, what, when will these things be? When is this temple coming down? He answers that in verses 4 through 35. And then, what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? We well, answer to that in verses 36 through 51. Now, not everyone agrees with that. Like I said, there are lots of interpretations of Matthew chapter 24, lots of disagreement, even among those who, dis who agree. There are you know, minor points of disagreement. But I think that makes a lot of sense of the text. And the reason I say that, and the reason I would say it's not just all future, it's not just all, in, in this case, thousands of years from now, is Jesus is speaking clearly. If you read the text, Jesus is speaking to them. Jesus is speaking to the, to the disciples who will experience at least some of these things. He is, he is speaking to disciples who will hear these things and see these things and endure these particular things. In fact, we can understand lots of these things were lots of these things happened to the disciples. If you look at verses 4 all the way down to verse 14, I mean, you see from the New Testament, uh, from what we know in first century church history, a lot of these things actually happened. The disciples were actually hated and persecuted first century. There were false messiahs, uh, just like there are in every age. There were wars and rumors of wars. There were famines and earthquakes. All of these things, in fact, took place as the gospel was going forward. And that fact, that's how I would understand verse 14, where Jesus said, and this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world. Now, that doesn't mean in this, in this time, for example, in the Amazon, we see the same thing, for example, in Luke chapter 2. You remember when the, the, the whole world is to be taxed? Well, that didn't mean, you know, Canada at, the, at that point. Uh, it meant the whole Roman world. And so I think that's exactly what we see here. This gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all the nations. And then the end will come. Well, what is that end? Was the end that Jesus has been speaking about, which is the destruction of the temple, which is what I think we see beginning in verse 15, where it says, So when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel, standing in the holy place, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. That's, that's, that this abomination of desolation is clearly one of the keys to understanding what Jesus is talking about. Now, again, scholars are divided here, but I think it makes sense to identify what we see here. Again, not with just something in the future, but even what was happening in their lives or in their generation and what we know is that some 40 years after this, the temple was destroyed by the Romans. The Jewish historian Josephus tells us, really kind of gives us a history of that particular account, of that particular event, that the Romans laid siege to Jerusalem around 66 AD, that all kinds of suffering uh, occurred in the years that follow that. We, we know that, for example, the famine that occurred in Jerusalem as the Romans laid siege to it, it was so severe that mothers began to eat their children, that people began to eat from public sewers. We know that cadavers were piled up and they were eventually just thrown over the city walls. Josephus tells us that room was wanting for the crosses and crosses wanting for the bodies. 
And then in 70 AD, the walls were finally breached. The destruction was total, according to some estimates. Over a million people died in the destruction of Jerusalem. Those that survived were sold as slaves. And the temple? The temple was utterly destroyed. Not one stone was left on another, exactly as Jesus had said. And I think that's exactly what Jesus is speaking of and how he's speaking in verse 35, or verse 34, rather, where he says, Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things, which is exactly the phrase that's used back in verse 3. When will these things be? When is the temple coming down? Jesus said, Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things have taken place. To put it simply, Jesus was telling the disciples how the house of Israel would be left desolate. The religious leaders were rejecting the Son of Man promised and foretold of, foretold in Daniel chapter 7, the one you remember who, who comes on the clouds to the Ancient of Days, who receives a kingdom, he receives glory, he receives power. Uh, all nations, people, languages should serve him. Again, very speaking of Christ, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion, whose kingdom will not pass away. All of that, I think, is exactly what Jesus is talking about in verses 29 through 31. We see the, the, the sun and the moon going dark. We see the stars falling from heaven. That's just kind of stock and trade prophetic language that was used in the prophets to speak of regime change, of a new king coming along. And of course, that's exactly what happens as Jesus comes onto the scene. There is a new king. There is a new kingdom. In fact, there is a new temple where the presence of God dwells and where, true, where forgiveness is truly found. And so Jesus is telling them they are living at the time when one kingdom is falling and another one is rising, the true and living Israel. You see, the destruction of Jerusalem, is, it's a terrifying the really realistic picture of the cost of rejecting Jesus. It is like a preview of the judgment that outside of Christ, there is no hope, there is no future, there is no life. In many ways, this is like the conclusion of the Sermon on the Mount. You remember what Jesus said? And again, remember this house language and the fall of the house. Everyone who hears these words of mine does not do them. It's like a foolish man who built his house on the sand, the rain fell, the floods came, the wind blew and beat against the house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. So what about the second question? I mean, is, is everything in the past tense? Is everything just, it's already happened, and, and therefore, you know, what is, there, what is left for us? Well, I think that's where Jesus turns in verse 36, and he picks up on the second part of, these, of, the, of their question, Number one, when will these things be? He answers that. And then, what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the ages? Verse 36, but concerning that day and hour, no one knows. Not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. For as were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day. When Noah entered the ark, and they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. It said verse 42, Therefore stay awake, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. Verse 44, Therefore you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Now, we may stop and wonder about verse 36 where Jesus says the Son of Man doesn't even know the day or the hour. Uh, certainly there's great mystery in that. I think Jesus is speaking there uh, in terms of his human nature. Um, but I think the bigger point is not the ignorance of Jesus or, or what Jesus says about his own knowledge of his own coming. It's the indifference of the people. Notice he says there, for as were the days of Noah. In other words, on that day when Jesus, when, when, when Jesus finally comes, he says, on that day, it will be, it'll be rather ordinary, maybe even mundane, that there will be birthday parties, there will be golf outings, there'll be baseball games, there'll be concerts going on, all the things that we associate with regular life, even a lot of the things that we now look forward to, things returning to normal. Jesus says, on that day, as it was in the days of Noah, 
the flood of God's judgment will be unleashed on the earth and only those who are ready will be spared. That's why the key lines, again, what can we really know? What is not obscure, but what is obvious? Verse 42, stay awake, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. 44, therefore you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. To put it differently and to answer the question that the disciples ask in verse 3, what will be the sign of your coming? And the end of the age, answer, there is no sign. It's just going to happen. J.C. Ryle was the great, Angl great Anglican preacher of the 19th century. He said, he said this about the last days. He said, the godly and the ungodly at present are all mingled together. In the congregation and in the place of worship, in the city and the field, the children of God and the children of the world are all side by side. But it shall not be so always. In the day of our Lord's return, there shall at length be a complete division. Wives shall be separated from husbands, parents from children, brothers from sisters, masters from servants, preachers from hearers. There shall be no time for parting words or change of mind when the Lord appears. All shall be taken as they are and reap according as they have sown. Believers shall be caught up to glory, honor, and eternal life. Unbelievers shall be left behind to shame and everlasting contempt. Who can describe the happiness of those who are taken when the Lord returns? Who can imagine the misery of those who are left behind? May we think on these things and consider our ways. Indeed, that's the point of the passage as a whole. Think on these things and consider our ways. I hope that, that you're using these unique and, and maybe even scary times to do just that. Maybe these last few months have prompted you to think that this is the end of the world. If so, good. Not because it is, but because it might be. But concerning the day and the hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven. Watch, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. Let's pray. Lord, would you make us a watchful people? We know that judgment is coming indeed. Judgment is coming with Jesus. Would you help us to avoid complacency and a love for this world that lulls us to sleep and that dulls our senses? Would you give us an urgency alongside our confidence in Christ, even as we pray and long for the coming of our Lord? We ask in his name. Amen. Lift your voices.